Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, open interventions, and that's kind of what you're going to really focus on upstairs in the lab today. It's interesting that um, I started one of the first endovascular aneurysm training courses at Emory, and now we're running an open aortic training course here, and we've kind of actually moved boot camp a little bit more. Four or five years ago, it was all these endovascular interventions. Now we're kind of moving it back towards cadavers and focusing a little bit more on, on the open stuff. So I'm, I'm delighted, actually, to see how much experience there is uh, in, the, in the lower extremity. I think some of this you've kind of already, you already heard. Again, just to reiterate, my approach when I walk through the door and the patient's been sent in with uh, usually some sort of imaging that says she's got blockage or partly blockage in the blood vessels. You say, Mrs. Smith, what's wrong? She's got blocked blood vessels. They kind of expect you to fix the blood vessels. I say, okay, so I take you outside and I walk you along the street. And, you know, at the same time I'm feeling her foot and Mrs. Smith tells me, you know, I walk along the street, basically I get one block, I get pain, pain is in the appropriate area. Then what do you do? I stop. Okay, then what do you do? I start again. And then what do you do? Then I stop. And, you know, it's pretty convincing that they've got a vascular problem. Even if the foot doesn't look that bad, they've probably got true uh, uh, vasculogenic claudication, if you want to put it that way. It's the ones who say, well, it hurts when I walk, but it's in my back and it's basically in my joints, or I get up and I may, as soon as I walk, it goes away. It's in kind of a different ballgame. And so the majority of them, less than 5% of these patients are going to go, are not going to um, progress to limb loss. So that's what they often want to be reassured about. Now, Having said that, you know, in the vascular board several years ago, it would be if you said you got a patient with claudication, you were going to intervene on them, well, you're out of that, man. You're not going to pass this. And really, that was equally inappropriate. You know, I think my job is to explain to patients is to explain to you what I can do, and, you know, what the natural history of this is, and that you really don't need an intervention. And I said, I'm not going to make this decision for the intervention. My job is to explain to you what the interventions that are available, what the risk is. You need to tell me whether you're willing to accept the rest. Because it may be that a patient re, you know, is, um, does love for cycling or something like that, and they want to get out there, and they want to be able to more, be more active. But I don't say we're not going to do the intervention. You look at the lesion. You decide basically how complex that's going to be. If you've got a little stenosis in the SFA um, that's very focal, I think it's not at all unreasonable to go ahead and angioplasty that or a little small stent. So I think that's kind of the job. When we're talking basically about bypasses, we tend to be basically more in the critical limb ischemia, although again, I don't think an above knee fempop is unreasonable. I think you saw those five-year patencies for um, endovascular interventions. They don't exist. You know, if you're somebody gets a 20-centimeter stent put in the SFA, I will guarantee you, there's not many guarantees, that will not be open three to four years from now. And so what tends to happen is you commit these patients to re-intervention again, and you get kind of sucked into this. And by and large, although the consequences of a vascular graft going down tend to be more consequential than an endovascular intervention, the good news of an endovascular intervention that fails, you usually go back to baseline. Not always, and repeated interventions often basically trash the, the outflow. But the vascular grafts, when they go down, I'd say they go down a little bit harder than the average endovascular intervention. But, you know, one of the, the challenges, I think, that we have failed in, there's not any manufacturer who's going to invest in the saphenous vein, okay? Uh, they're just not going to do it. And so the investment all goes into these new technologies and, and, and new devices that, that, that are out there. And for every vascular, and indeed cardiac intervention, you think about the heart, for example. Um, there is the only thing that ever makes you live longer in the corny world is a lima to an LED bypass. Not a balloon, not a stent, not the vein grafts have been ever shown to make you live longer. Uh, do you think that'd be on the consent form when you actually talk to the patients? No, it's not on the consent form. Um, and so despite that, the durability of that bypass graft is incredible and the benefits are incredible. Now when you go out, but the delivery system, so we have essentially sacrificed the core procedure, which is the bypass to the, to the LED, or, for example, open your belly and replace an aortic aneurysm with a dacron graft. We have sacrificed the core procedure, which is the, operate, the core part of the operations, just replacing the aneurysm, for example. Nothing is as durable or as efficacious as putting that piece of dacron. And so we've given that up. Why? Because of for the sake of delivery system. Your delivery system sucks. Big incision, clamp the aorta, put this thing in there. The delivery system for endograph, it's great, goes in through the groin, but the, the core therapeutic component basically is nowhere near as close. And it's the same thing for the lower extremity. So we have allowed the 
prioritization of the delivery system to override the core efficacious component of that. And we've done a very bad job as a group of surgeons to figure out how do we maintain that core part and change it? Is it laparoscopic aortic surgery? Is it using hybrid grafts of some kind that we're going to get in there? And so I think that's one of the challenges that you guys should be basically looking at as we move forward. So critical limb scheme you've heard about is almost never one level. It's usually multi-segmental disease. The pain, Mark mentioned this a little bit, is across the metatarsophalangeal head. When the patient sits up, bends their knee, and grabs their forefoot right behind their toe and says, oh my gosh, it hurts like hell. It wakens me up at night. What do you do? I hang my bed, I hang my leg off the side of the bed, or I get up and sit in the chair. You got it. You know it. And these are usually patients that you look at their leg and it's pretty obvious, really, uh, you know, that there's something going on there. But there are other things that involve in the differential diagnosis. And so the claudicants, I explain to them what I can do and what the risks are. These are the guys I'm driving hard to go ahead, basically, and have an intervention. And so these are more urgent. And you really, these are the patients who are going to go ahead and lose their leg unless you basically intervene on them. I think we've covered most, basically, of that. So most of your claudicants then are not going to die basically from losing the leg. They're going to die from these other uh, cardiovascular events, stroke MI. And you're going to be dealing with the highest cardiovascular disease burden of any patients that are out there. So one of my intensivists stopped knew me recently and a pretty experienced guy says, you know, you guys, patients are so sick. And said, like, well, there's a revolution. I finally discovered that. He said, you know, the, the problem is that when a patient goes in for open heart surgery, they come out physiologically better then they went in. We take a group of patients who are sick as dogs, and then we lay a big operation, and they're not any physiologically better. We don't fix their heart. We don't fix any of that stuff. We see we lay the biggest operations we can imagine really on these patients. So again, it's a matter of understanding what their functional capacity actually is, understanding what the disease load and their comorbidities are. I also think it's our job really to be managing, making sure those patients are on statins, make sure they're on aspirin, make sure the blood pressure is controlled. It's not that we're going to bring them back to control the blood pressure, but it's part of of our checklist and going through and making sure you can't just default that really to the cardiologist. So is it necessary to treat uh, critical limb ischemia? Yeah, these are the patients with high amputation rates and they also have poor long-term survival. When you take a patient who has got end-stage renal disease with a gangrenous toe, their two-year survival is absolutely atrocious. So everything that you're doing, you know, has to be uh, predicated upon the expected survival rate basically of that patient. So again, once again, for the sake of reiterating this again, it's to improve quality of life. That patient, for me, is intimately involved in that decision process. I do not push them one way or another. Uh, I try to explain as rationally as I can what the lesion is, what the intervention is, and what the risk is going to be. And sometimes it's going to, we may do this once, but I'm not going to come back here repeating this thing basically again and again and again. Critical limb ischemia, on the other hand, you're trying to relieve the symptoms, you're trying basically to maintain their limb. And that kind of covers at a variety of different levels. You know, if a, if a patient loses their toes, well, they're very happy about it, but you know, that's really for putting nail polish on. Uh, it's about ambulation. What you really want is to maintain their heel. And so what John's going to talk about next is the different kinds of amputations. That's another, you know, pet peeve of mine. It's when I round in our service and I hear the podiatrist is seeing this person, the podiatrist is seeing this person, you know, and then I basically at conference go, okay, you tell me how you do a toe amputation. And their residents look at us like, what? You know, the strength of our specialty is the breadth of procedures that you can do and the variety of different vascular churches that you work in. And, you know, if our guys basically like taking one in four call as opposed to one in five or one in six call because we're building the podiatry service, then that's fine. That's a decision you've got to make. But I still think those skill sets really belong in it. And although we're in the limb salvage business, understanding what those amputations are are extraordinarily important. The problem with these patients is they're sick and they have a high mortality rate. There's a variety of different uh, guidelines that are out there really for classifying this. I think Jason's touched on the fact that endovascular interventions work great in the ear for occlusive disease in the aortoiliac segment with diminishing efficacy as you, as you essentially go down the leg. And that's one of the things that there's a huge focus for industry. Viva's coming up. If you go to Viva, you're going to think that we've cured SFA occlusive disease. Um, well, I can tell you that is not the case. And the reason that Jason showed 20 different methods basically of treating it is because none of them have been proven to be durable. Now, I'll tell you what cardiology does better than us is that they have a much lower long-term vision. The challenge for you is that you got a decision to make for Mrs. Smith tomorrow, okay? You can do both of these things. You have to decide whether the, you alone 
one get to decide whether you're going to do an open operation or an endovascular operation. The other specialties are not thinking about that. They're just going to do an endovascular intervention. And I think that's one of, one of the challenges and an opportunity really for our specialty is, is being able to think through not just the short-term intervention, but long-term, how, how should these basically be treated? So you can, you can read this. This is basically out there, um, and I don't really use it that much, quite honestly. So aortic occlusive disease, again, I still think there's a place for aorta by femoral bypass. Um, there's, when you've got focal disease in the common iliac and the aorta, these procedures work very well. When you've got long segment occlusions, again, we can almost always get across these lesions, but we've not always been able to keep them open. That's particularly true in the SFA segment, less and less true up in the aortoiliac segment as we get better and better tools how to do it. I'm going to go, go through this. So, so something like this, this is kind of a shaggy aorta. You look at this and shudder just a little bit because the IMA is coming off that. It's got a nasty calcified coral reef looking aorta in there. Can we treat this with an endovascular intervention? Well, you can treat any of them with an endovascular intervention, but you've got to judge the risks. The risk here would be distal embolization. The risk here would be embolization down the IMA and taking the IMA out. So you need to know about the collaterals. But this is something that could be treated uh, with an open aortic operation, endarterectomy, all based upon the, the life expectancy, basically, of these patients. So I'm going to... Here, of course, a slightly different situation. Again, what you're looking at, the aorta is almost completely occluded here. Uh, the left common iliac is occluded. As long as there's kind of a string sign, you can always get, get a wire up through. It may take a little bit of work to do this. Uh, it would be a little bit harder on the left side. You can come from above. Typically, we would try to do this really from below. It's not about getting into the iliac occlusion itself. It's about re-entering the aura that, that, that's going to be uh, the challenge. And again, as we get more extensive disease, I still think there's a situation here. We would just treat this with angioplasty and stent on the right side. Uh, maybe even the new VBX, these stents that Gore have now come up with, I think are going to be transformed here except if there's a branch because they stick on the stent, they don't really come off um, and you're not going to get restenosis actually occurring through them. So the autobifemoral bypass, you kind of saw a lot of these things yesterday. The, the downside of a aortobifemoral bypass is the femoral part of it. We need to figure out how we don't make groin incisions. If we could actually figure out how to do an anastomosis in the groin, you know, either going underneath the skin or basically alongside it, then because the, cause the Achilles heel of this is if you get a groin infection. And one of the things that keeps us away from this is this, this idea that you put a aortic graft down there, and next thing the groin is all red and there's pus draining out of it. And then this is just this has converted this into both a limb-threatening, basically, and, and light-threatening situation. Typically, for occlusive disease, of course, you're going to do endocide proximally and endocide distally. The profunda uh, that was mentioned is the key. You really don't want to lose that. You also need to how, know how to image it. So you need, you know, if it's on the left side, left anterior oblique, so that you don't have any overlap. Frequently, you will find people, basically, who shoot the arteriograms in the wrong way, in the wrong orientation. Again. That should be the difference between what people on this side of the wall are doing and people on that side of the wall. Sometimes the quality of arteriograms that get referred from outside are just atrocious, and we really can't have that kind of situation. So I think you heard about this, this yesterday. You already can direct me. Uh, I've probably done two of these in my entire life, and so they see it's a very uh, limited number of patients that so this can be applied to. Typically, it's where you've got these fungating lesions inside the aura, and yet the visceral segment vessels, the ideal ones, Space are, are not completely compromised by this because it's not that easy to end out rectomize blindly down on the origin of the SMA and celiac. It's pretty easy to end out rectomize the aorta and take the stuff out. But if these lesions are tracking down into the, the uh, visceral vessels, you know, those are the ones you get in trouble with if you can't actually see really what those endpoints actually are. Let me go through this. But you can get some pretty nice uh, specimens actually can, can come out of this. Um, iliofemoral bypass, still a role for this. Most of the time you're going to be doing this is actually as a conduit that allows you to, uh, to deliver an endograph really up into, into the aorta. Femoral femoral bypass, not a particularly good operation. Um, but, you know, in certain situations, it, it, can, it can get you out of a difficult situation. Uh, in patients who are too sick for the aorta, uh, an aortic operation, then you can do an axe by fem. Again, this is not something that you would do in a young patient. It's often used when you've got infections in the aorta and you've got to deliver volume uh, blood supply down to the lower extremity, but they're not going to last, you know, 10 years. And so as a short-term bridge, you know, not a bad, bad, thing to, uh, bad thing to be able to do. And one of the important things 
as you see that arm is abducted there, the reason for doing that is if you put the arm by the side, the patient does that, it extends the, um, the, the graft, or the lengthens that distance between the axillary artery and the groin, and it can actually evolve off the axillary artery. And always listen to the patient. When I was at uh, Emory, as an attending, I was covering the service on the weekend, and um, there's a lady who one of my partners had done an ax family. And um, husband was an old farmer, sat in the corner of the room. And we'd come in and seen the patient. We'd look at the incision. We'd look at the groin. Everything looked fine. The leg was perfused. And after doing this for a couple of days, the husband said, what do you think that big pulsating thing is dark on the side of my wife's chest? What? So now we actually pull the gown up and look at where the tunnel in is. And there's this giant pulsating aneurysm basically on the side of the chest. Like, how in the hell did you get an aneurysm here? Did they nail the lateral thoracic cord? And so we're standing there and wonder, how on earth? And the patient said, Doctor, you think it's because they didn't have a long enough graft and they had to splice two pieces together? It's got anything to do with it? I went, oh. And so they'd, they'd sewn two pieces of graft, pulled it through the tunnel, the patient had moved, the whole thing had come apart, it was still perfused, and there's, and there's a gap between the two ends of the, the, those grafts. So anyway, these are the kind of things that you need to, you need to be aware of, and um, I'm not going to go down to the, the lower extremity stuff we're going to cover you know, up, in the, uh, up, up in the lab today. You will do a lot of common femora and arterectomies and profundoplasty. This is an area where you need to know the anatomy. You need to get the skill set down really on how to do this, how to put a patch on there, how to dissect down the profunda. And this is something that you, you, you can try to do and get control of those first couple of, couple of branches. All right, I'm going to stop at that. Yeah.